um, something that you said really resonate in terms of what NSBA um, gives us as business owners the opportunity, and that is to advocate and to educate. And um, serving on the Leadership Council is a great entree into kind of um, kind of uh, testing out our chops, right, uh, in, in that whole advocacy and engaging with our legislators. You know, as you mentioned, I um, come to this in a very kind of in a different path. Um, when I was serving in the Obama administration, you know, I in terms of advocating on behalf of small businesses, I was more so um, kind of being responsible for key policies that were being implemented to impact small business owners. And so now to be able to serve on the board of trustees to give voice and lend my voice um, on behalf of more small of small businesses to really continue to drive policies on behalf of small businesses. So I really encourage um, business owners and leadership council members to take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, but B, we're already seeing some of these changes right now. Uh, I mean, we're seeing that that you know President Biden reopened the open enrollment for folks. Uh, we're talking about additional subsidies uh, for insurance. Will, will the, how will these things play out in the individual and small group markets? Should we expect the subsidies to put downward pressure on premiums? Should we expect the open enrollment to put upward pressure on premiums? Um, will either one be enough that most business owners will notice? What should we expect sort of from the market uh, as these policies go into effect, do you think, over the next year or so? Well, Tom, let me kick this one off because you're going to have the expertise here to, um, I wouldn't be able to follow you on this one. Um, I, I'll, I'll say this, um, our, our plans and the Alliance of Community Health Plans have been supportive of uh, the administration's special enrollment period for for people that um, can get back into the market if they weren't able to do it during open enrollment at the end of last year. Um, and many state-based exchanges have been leaving their um, uh, open enrollment uh, running or, or they're um, coming in, you know, picking up what the federal facilitated exchanges are doing with open enrollment. Um, with that all being said, I, I think there are some questions and I would be interested to hear what Tom would have to say about this um, in regard to some of the changes that are proposed in the Ways and Means Bill for the increase in subsidies or moving the, uh, the subsidy cliff <clears throat> and the ability for people to switch plan levels, different metal levels within open enrollment that's now open to the extent that those collide. Um, and, and I think that's what the, the, it's envisioned. Um, what type of impact that has on the market? And I think it just depends on what market you're in uh, on the exchange side of things. Um, but uh, I, that, that's a question that our members have been pondering right now and trying to get their heads around in terms of uh, the potential for kind of manipulation in the marketplace. Um, and with that in mind, I, I think that, you know, we would like to, to see some acknowledgement of that uh, as Congress is moving forward with uh, increasing subsidies during a new open enrollment period and considering what type of guardrails can be put in place to ensure that there's some stability in the market moving forward. Yeah, I think that's a great, great question. And I think I agree with basically everything you've said. We don't see this open enrollment creating a lot of disruption. Uh, we have to remember, we just had an open enrollment. So um, there are not a lot of people out there who haven't had a chance to get into the market and, and want to. Um, if, we, if we started doing special open enrollments three times a year on a predictable basis, then maybe people might start sitting out the market and waiting until they had an, an urgent need. But doing this once in the middle of the pandemic, um, I, I don't think that disrupts anything. In general, the uh, higher the subsidies, the more representative slice of the population you expect to sign up. Mm -hmm. It just makes it a better deal for healthier and younger people to enter the market. Um, so in general, I think broader subsidies, as long as they're well-designed, are, are going to help. And 
maybe not make a dramatic inquiry, um, dramatic impact on gross premium levels, although if you get some healthier people, it, it should bring them down some. Um, more importantly, it's going to lower the net premiums that consumers are facing. Um, is, is that consistent with the way you're viewing it? Yeah, I think that's right. I, you know, we just kind of hear a mixed bag of experiences. Um, you know, some plans in state-based exchanges that have had open, that did an open enrollment last year did not see um, a dramatically different risk profile um, in terms of the numbers of people that entered into the market at that time. Um, we've heard concerns from uh, from other markets. Um, you know, if you look at South Texas or um, maybe some other states that, um, that the state is not operating the exchange in the state, just depending on the dynamics, they may feel like there could be a bigger uh, population of uninsured that never elected to go in and maybe the, the new um, increased subsidies incentivize them to do so. But I, I agree. I, I don't, I don't know if it really moves the needle all that much and, and um, the experiences that we have to date suggest otherwise, but um, there certainly is some, um, I don't know if it's PTSD from, from years prior or not, but uh, some concern around the potential for adverse selection in that case. One of the things we saw in this last year's open enrollment and renewals from a lot of small group plans were, uh, basically very small increases and in a lot of numbers of cases decreases in healthcare small decreases in healthcare premiums and i think todd to answer your question about the short term and this would be very short term uh, during covid times remember that uh, a lot of providers were not doing elective surgeries uh, the hospitals in fact were uh, and uh, ambulatory, ambulatory uh, service centers were, were not allowed in, by state uh, uh, mandates to do those types of elective surgeries. And so a lot of groups, uh, what even community rated groups, uh, were seeing decreases in uh, premiums. I think that short term, and I'm concerned a year after, two years after uh, the end of the pandemic, uh, what happens to all that backlog of elective surgeries? Let's start. Bob's going to jump in here with some with some questions and, and dialogue also. But let's kind of start at the top. There's there's so many things that that, that we think will be happening this year uh, on the employment front um, from changes to immigration law to to, to maybe some new. Uh, uh, ways we manage workforce to the ability of, of unions to organize in, in smaller and smaller shops. So as you look at that landscape, what do you think is most likely to happen first? Uh, what are the things that sort of keep you up at night that you think we all ought to know more about? So Mark, why don't you go first and we'll ask Josh. Um, sure. And, and some of these things are things that I'm working most closely on and some of these things are, are things that Josh is working most closely on. So I think you'll get a fair reading. Um, <clears throat> If I had to highlight the things that are going to happen soonest, um, I would put the OSHA response to the um, you know coronavirus issue up there as number one in one A. Um, whether they're going to do an emergency temporary standard is, I think, the issue that is occupying a lot of attention right now. Right. Um, and I think, as some of you may have seen, the president has directed OSHA to consider whether to do an ETS and to, if so, to put one out by March 15th. So we're on a fairly tight window as to whether something's gonna happen and, and finding out what that's gonna look like. To be honest with you, I think all the smart money is on the idea of them coming out with an ETS. Um, the question really is what does it look like? How much does it pick up things that have been very troubling uh, in states that have done it like California? So that that's really sort of where most of the attention and, and discussion lies right now. Um, <clears throat> outside of the OSHA kind of discussion, there's a lot of wage and hour things I think we're gonna see activity on. That will probably wait until they get an administrator in place. Um, you know, there's some EEOC things I think that are gonna show up and some, some compensation data questions that are gonna show up. Um, the legislative side, I mean, you know, you've got the COVID package moving through, which you know, may or may not include a minimum wage component. 
That's the big debate right now. Right. Um, they seem to be having trouble keeping all the Democrats on board with that idea, which which may mean it, it won't show up the way they talked about it. But I think we'll see something in the minimum wage area at some point. Josh, I want to let you fill in the gaps, sir. Yeah, that's a good start, Mark. I, and I think that covers a lot of the activity that's going to go forward. Um, I agree with Mark on everything he said with respect to, to what we're going to see. I think the ETS may be the first time, Mark. Um, I think the ETS is probably, um, you know, as Mark said, definitely coming at us. It just depends on what's going on. Uh, Mark and I are both trying to engage OSHA and the new folks there. It's a, a confusing you know, transition um, is confusing all the time. And with COVID sitting over it and various other political things kind of involved, um, it's definitely uh, something where it's difficult to make the connections and they're moving very quickly um, per the president's order, uh, executive order. But it's, you know, nailing down what does California look like? What are the, the problems with that? What do we do forward? Mark and I and others are working kind of hand in hand to move forward that. Um, with respect to um, some of the traditional labor stuff, which uh, Mark was indicating, some of us handle one, one thing more than ever. I, I sit a lot in the traditional labor space, the mm -hmm. labor management relations space. Um, we are, uh, you know, the PRO Act is in front of Congress and, and the president said he backs it. Um, and, and certainly there are members of Congress that support that act. The PRO Act is um, the newest uh, latest version of kind of a, a comprehensive uh, pro-union labor reform. Now we've seen these types of bills um, probably uh, rise to the potential of passing once a decade since the 1970s. Um, the Senate filibuster has been the thing that has prevented that from occurring. In the 1970s, um, we had labor law reform. In the 1990s, we had striker replacement. In the OTS, we had um, uh, the Employee Free Choice Act, and now we have the PRO Act. Um, all those bills over time were all engaged to increase union density, ease the ability to, to unionize, et cetera. Um, you know, those have all, as I said, been def defeated by the filibuster at the end of the day. Here, um, I think that will also be the case. Um, the, the PRO Act is, you know, may even struggle to get through the House because of the, the, the changes in, in the makeup of the House from last Congress. They passed it last Congress. They may have a more difficult time. And then the filibuster sits here as a blockade to kind of move it through that. But the bigger question is, you know, whether that remains in place. We have two senators that say on the Democratic side that say they're not going to change the filibuster. Um, but even if it did change, uh, there's a real question if, if the unions could, could get the, the 50 um, Democratic standards all to agree to all the provisions in there. Many of them upsetting, many of the ones you, that were mentioned at the top of the call here, um, not in the wage hour context, as Mark was talking about, um, you know, over at DOL, but in, in the union organizing, and, the, and those are independent contractor and, and joint employer um, and, and the things we've seen before that, that really have a potential, even if there's not a union organizing drive, to disrupt things for um, very small businesses um, that depend on contracts from larger businesses or that depend on an independent contractor model to meet their needs. The, the, those changes in the law would be disruptive, whether you're a target of union organizing or you're not. There are changes in the law that everyone has to follow. So um, that's kind of my thought. Um, taking you off know, you know, you know, I, I skipped over the wage and hour heading pretty quickly, but I should have noted that in the short term window, um, the rulemaking, the regulation on independent contractors that the Trump uh, department issued at the very end is still an open question. Um, it, it was a final reg, um, but the effective date was 60 days out, so it hasn't gone into effect. And there is now a notice and comment process on the question of whether it should be suspended. So we will be engaging in that to support the idea of that regulation going into effect. Um, I, I really take a very positive attitude towards that regulation. I think it's very balanced. It does not presage uh, a determination as the critics of it would have you believe. I, I think under their analysis, um, 
there is still ample opportunity for workers to be classified as employees, it does not um, guarantee an independent contractor um, classification. Yeah. So I, well, I think you, the regulation is, is much better than the way it's been attacked right. uh, as being. But that, you, that is a short-term item. That, that's in front of us, and you know they will be making a decision about what to do with that uh, in, in yeah. some period of weeks or months. Well, Mark, could you just take a minute and maybe explain briefly for folks who may not be as familiar with that rule, what exactly it does and what the benefit of it would be for uh, small businesses? Well, essentially what it does is it takes the term economic uh, reality test, which is enshrined in certain litigation, and builds it out so that people understand what it means. Um, in the Obama years, they issued an interpretation on what an economic realities test meant. And to be perfectly honest with you, it basically slanted everything towards someone being found as an employee. Um, in this case, the Department of Labor has built some other structures around that in terms of issues of control and whether the employee, whether the worker has an opportunity for profit or loss and, and how much they contribute to the enterprise. Uh, and so, we now know better, or at least this regulation um, gives employers and employees and independent contractors a much clearer sense of what it means to, to work under the economic realities test. What in the world is going to happen on tax policy this year? I mean, a lot of people are afraid we're going to see big Biden tax increases, uh, but Janet Yellen says, no, no, don't worry about that right now. Brian, what do you think? Um, I, I, I'm afraid that we're going to see big tax increases this year. Um, and, and I went into the year uh, telling people that if you, you know, when a president gets elected, they have this very strange habit of actually uh, trying to do the things that they promised that they were going to do in, in, in the election. <laughs> they, they feel like, you know, very seriously, they these are the things I ran on. They won I won. You know, these are good policies. I want to get them done. Um, and so I think folks should take a look at the Biden tax plan. Um, I think it didn't get the attention it deserved for a variety of reasons. One, because you had all those wealth taxes and other things that were really extreme being thrown around at the same time. Um, also, there just wasn't that much focus on policy. But it is an extremely large tax package. It's very aggressive. Um, it would undo the corporate tax cuts that were made in 2017 and then some. So it's not just restoring the corporate tax to where it was under tax or before tax reform. It actually goes and increases taxes on C corporations by a lot. Um, a similar effect would take place with, with passers, S corporations and partnerships. Um, as state taxes would go up, cap gains taxes would go up. Um, they would, they want to apply social security taxes to wages over $400,000. It's a very aggressive plan. With the narrow majorities that they have in the House and the Senate, I don't think they're going to be able to get all of that enacted. My expectation is if you take what Biden's put forward and maybe divide it in half, that's probably what's possible legislatively for them. And then the other question, the final question is, when are they going to do this? And early on, I thought it was going to be early, this spring, this summer, that sort of thing. Increasingly, I'm hearing uh, from Democrats and Republicans alike that it's big tax hikes like that are unlikely early this year, maybe later this year, maybe next year. There does seem to be a recognition that the economy is extremely fragile right now and raising taxes on employers across the board would be a really bad idea. So tax hikes are on the horizon, but my guess is that it's a little further off than maybe I, certainly than I initially thought. Yeah. Darren, does that sound right to you? Yes, that, that does sound generally right uh, to me as well. Uh, generally, what we're seeing right now is a focus by Congress and the president on the very large uh, stimulus package that we're seeing uh, that includes some tax elements, but the tax hike side of things are more, more likely to happen closer to the end of the year or early next, probably paired with large spending proposals related to infrastructure, climate mitigation, R&D, healthcare. Uh, one thing that we saw in the Biden campaign was a close pairing of various tax increases with spending proposals as a pay for. And so they may use the hook of trying to partially pay for very large increases in spending uh, in order to uh, sort of sidestep potential criticism about potential tax hikes. 
Um, and some of this may be also be to monitor the economic situation uh, because e even with the Biden administration, they are sensitive to the idea that we don't want to be undercutting an economic recovery and introducing not just reversals of the, of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, as, as Brian mentioned, but uh, adding new taxes on top of that, some of which have never uh, haven't been tried in a very long time. For example, applying ordinary income tax rates to capital gains that may have a, a pretty large impact in the business community and, and investment. Uh, and that's something they're going to have to take their time to design if, if uh, they want it to be implemented effectively. And, and that uh, gives them some more breathing room if they do it closer to the end of the year.